My product is called The Pillow. A beach towel with an integrated pillow. Society9 is the brand for badass women. This will make me a multimillionaire. We are an angel investment group, and we all bring a different expertise to the table. At 19, I founded an award-winning winery. I led marketing at Facebook. I got my start at 15 in the tech world. I have over 400 items on the market. What's unique about this group, we go out, meet with entrepreneurs, learn their personal stories. It's not just about writing them a check. We give them challenges. We're going to give you 72 hours to get it done. The stakes are incredibly high. I think this concept is all wrong, and we need to change it completely. We just have to regroup. How do I keep this brand alive? I'm already seeing this as a fail. Single mom with two kids, I knew that I had to do something to make our lives better. I've put in every ounce of my savings. I'm over 200 grand in debt. I'm just so worried for you because I don't want you to lose everything. I want you to prove that this will work. I want this to exist so bad, and I'll fight for it. I'm up for the challenge. Let's do it. He did an awesome job. Yeah? I was like, whoa. Yay! Oh my god! This opportunity means everything to me. I'm excited about the potential this has. She's got the drive and the killer instinct. This is the opportunity to leave my job and run my business full time. If they can step up to the challenges that we put in front of them, these people can make millions. <laughs> that can change somebody's life. Hi. This is so cool. Hello, guys. Thanks for being here, Lauren, on Good Friday, no less. Of course. Of course. I'm an entrepreneur. Every day is a work day. <laughs> and let me preface this by saying I have no desire to quit my day job. I'm actually one of the very lucky people who loves my day job. But what I love about your show is that, A, it's really empowering for women, at least the episode that I saw. And B, it really, like, you guys really let anyone like with their entrepreneurial freak flag fly. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's not like, oh, here's a colander that's really cool. It's actually like really off the wall stuff. Yeah, you know, I think that's really um, representative of our lives as angel investors and mm -hmm. entrepreneurs is that we end up meeting so many people who are starting companies and they range from, you know, just very early stage, back of napkin, you know, I thought about in a Starbucks kind of idea to a company that really needs some growth capital to someone that just started a, a Kickstarter, Indiegogo. And so it really runs the gamut. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Quit Your Day Job is a real show. I mean, Oxygen is so committed to being very real, right? And so to your point, you see everything on our show. You see the companies that are, you know, about to really take off and those that may never go anywhere and those that need a lot of help. Um, so it's kind of our life. <laughs> and in your first episode, I, I love the fact that you booted the couple where uh, the guy, where the ownership of the company was inequitable, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. and that he wouldn't budge on the ownership. So how much do people's personal lives and their personal stories factor into your decisions? You know, they factor a lot into our decisions. And I always say that you know, for an entrepreneur, when you're making an investment, you're investing, yes, in the company, but you're investing in the entrepreneur mm -hmm. that you expect to run that company and be responsible day to day without you there. I mean, we can't hold their hands forever. And so, you know, in real life and also on the show, there are times where you meet an entrepreneur and sometimes you question their business model or you question their marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. And there are times when you meet the entrepreneur and you just question them. Like you question their ability. You're like, okay, you're really smart, but you're socially awkward, yeah. you know? Or you're really smart and this is a great industry. But, but you're a I control freak. But I don't think that you can actually do this. Or I don't think that you're going to be the person that can take constructive criticism, which means I'm questioning as an investor if I'm going to be effective at advising you if you're not going to listen or if other people people are going to advise you and you won't listen to them. And so, you know, in, in real life, we meet entrepreneurs all the time who uh, are a little holier than thou or think mm -hmm. they have all the answers or think they don't need any help. And so sometimes the, the concern that we have on the show and the way that we choose to challenge these companies, because we obviously we bring them on, we mentor them, we advise them, we give them a challenge, and that's their opportunity to shine. And not everyone shines. Some of them buckle under the pressure. But that is their opportunity to either show us that there is not um, you know, a concern that we should have in their business or that perhaps our assumption about what we perceive to be a character flaw is either true or hopefully false. 
Well, you yourself, see, and I knew that I would like you when I did my research on you and I read that you started a winery. I was like, that's my girl. And I liked you ever since your tweet this morning. Aww. <laughs> I love your bio. Look at us. <laughs> Look at us. Mutual Friday Love Fest. But in all seriousness, <laughs> what are the biggest turn-ons and turn-offs turn for you when you meet with, like, let's say I met with you and I was starting a line of Q-tip holders, Q-tip organizers. What what would be your biggest turn ons and turns uh, turn offs with the person, the entrepreneur, him or herself? I mean, the biggest turn off for me mm -hmm. is arrogance, personally. Um, that you have all the answers. No arrogance. Yeah, but that that yeah. that that entrepreneur thinks that maybe they have all the answers, but mm -hmm. it's not even that. Sometimes it's just in the way that they carry themselves. And honestly, sometimes it's the entrepreneurs who have had these really successful day jobs at mm -hmm. big companies where they've had people working under them, and you'll see some of this on the show also, and they come in with this like, hey, hey, you don't know who I am. But you have to kind of put that into context. And if you're now going into a new industry and a new business, and you want to become an entrepreneur, and this is you know new territory mm -hmm. for you, that's not necessarily relevant to our meeting um, at that point in time. It may be relevant to other meetings or to sourcing or other places that mm -hmm. you need to work on in your business and to your organizational structure, but it's not always necessary in that moment. And so I think arrogance is a, a big one. Um, funny enough, you know, people are still disheveled out there and like not pulled together, not polished, not on time, not, I mean, it's really the small things. It's not rocket science, right? Like to be presentable is not rocket science. We know how to dress and speak and act. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it also really shows you the true colors of that entrepreneur because, you know, we, we see mostly full-fledged adults. I mean, every once in a while we'll see a, a kid or something, you know, like a teen, like a, a really teen prodigy. But um, it's funny when you see someone and you look at them on paper and it's like, you know better. I can't believe you're doing this. Like, you know better than to do these like, things. Like, people actually you know? show up, like, unshowered and late. Oh, unshowered, late. You know, I grew up with a dad who was, like, big on manicures. And he was, like, mm -hmm. you know, either perfectly manicured hands or n no manicure at all. So you'd be surprised at just small things like that, like just not being pulled together, completely chipped nail polish, late, um, talking back in meetings, thinking you have all the answers, um, trying to control the meeting. I mean, just all sorts of things that are really small. And sometimes you look at someone and you're like, wow, okay, you're just, forget the business, just based on you, this isn't going anywhere. How much do personal stories factor in? So if you have someone coming in, you know, saying I have, invested all my life savings in my 401k and I'm literally down to $20 in the bank and if you don't support me, that's it. Like I'm gonna eat ramen for the, for the next month. Um, how much does that, how much weight does that carry with you? I think the personal story of the entrepreneur in the event that it's relevant to the business mm -hmm. is very, very compelling. Um, I think to the extent that the entrepreneur is like, hey, I'm broke, I didn't manage my, income or the way that I spent the money that I had very well, so invest in me, that doesn't really move the needle. Yeah, well. Again, it, it goes back to just a concern of, okay, well, did you think it was going to be easy? Did you think um, mm -hmm. you, know, you weren't going to struggle or were you not prepared to eat top ramen in your, in your example? Um, and I think that, that the biggest handicap of a lot of new entrepreneurs is that they're not thinking about their contingency plan. They're selling themselves so much on like the future success mm -hmm. of where they want to be and where they want to go. And that's enough to motivate them to, you know, make that jump into entrepreneurship, but that they're oftentimes not really thinking about, okay, well, my contingency plan A is this. If things get really tough, contingency plan B is this. And so when you see people that are like shocked by you know, circumstances that aren't shocking to those of us who have struggled to kind of find our own way to become successful and, you know, what we call it in the startup world being scrappy, mm -hmm. then it makes you wonder, like, are you not prepared to be scrappy? Are you not prepared to, like, have a really lean operation? Well, but then on the flip side, the young lady in the first episode with the weave scratcher, she really stepped up. Like, in the beginning, she was kind of like... I mean, you really, well, at least when I watched her, I was like, God, can she really sell a product? I mean, she doesn't, you know, really have that confidence that she, that there's, it's, she's kind of like demure. And then she just, boom, like, I don't know what you guys said to her, but, but she, she I nailed her, it. I gave her a couple of sessions of like, come on, girl, you got this, you got this, you got this. But, um, you know, we, you see that. It's life. Like, it's life. People freeze. They get, I mean, 
they get scared and intimidated in, in meeting us and coming to pitch us and hearing our advice and wondering if they're going to do it well or the way that we want them to do it or if it's going to be good enough. And you have to remember, like, they don't know their fate with us until the very end. They don't know if we're going to invest or not. So imagine spending a week with us, um, meeting us all, spending a week with us, and then hearing all of our advice, being expected to in some way implement it in your business um, and rise to a challenge so we hope. And you have to kind of smile and nod and, and hang with us for the whole week and you don't know if we're going to invest in you or not. So, um, you know, you see people that completely buckle under that mm -hmm. pressure and then you see people that are like, I got this. And I think that with Jamila um, of Weave Scratcher Pro, she, something went off. I don't know what, but there was like I this saw that light too. bulb yeah. moment for her and it wasn't, there was a time, like probably three or four days where it wasn't about are we gonna invest in her? She was just so present in that moment. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh my God, I'm never gonna get to have Lauren, Ido, Sarah, and Randy advising me again, perhaps. Like, I gotta take this time. Like, this is, this is valuable in itself. Um, and so she just lived in the moment. And I think that's when you see this light bulb go off and she's just, she starts shining and doing really well. Well, and that's the thing that I find so interesting that you say about people buckling under the pressure. I would imagine if you're trying to launch a company or a product, having four pros advise you for a week for free would be like yeah, and that was that light bulb. Dream. I think that went off for Jamila like, oh my God, what would this cost me? Whoa, okay, let me, okay. Let me just be present right now because there's a lot of value here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think, one of those moments also where you, know, you realize you're filming, you're working, but it's really your business and it's real-time advice and it can go that fast. Um, and so the people that really came on the show and did the best are those that were present in that moment. And I have to tell you, even the people that we don't invest in on the show, they still thank us. I mean, we have a few that don't thank us, but, you know, they, well, they still get a week's worth of advice. I'm telling I mean, you. It's like, it's, you can't put a price on that. So, yes, that we do have some people that are like, thank you so much for your time. Like, mm -hmm. this has been an invaluable experience, even though, you know, the outcome wasn't what they wanted. And for you personally, you know, you have said before that you thrive on failure, that failure is what you learn from. So what was a humbling moment in your own career? Uh, you know, I think a humbling moment in my own career was, um, <laughs> funny enough, it was not getting my way. And, um, but I knew that my way was the right way, and it was um, with Gen Y Capital, we were hiring, uh, looking to make a big hire, and I had business partners, I have business partners, and I didn't want to hire this individual. And they were all sold on this person and that they were great, and just something in me said no. But you have to remember, my first two businesses, I didn't have partners, really. I mean, I was, um, I had teams and employees, and I had silent partners, but I got to call the shots on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this was my first time ever that I had business partners that I had to persuade. And I realized I was not being very persuasive. Like, I'm just coming in saying, no, I don't want to hire this person. And I couldn't actually articulate my own intuition. And I shot myself in the foot. I didn't get my way. And we took this person on, we hired them, and it didn't go very well. But luckily, we salvaged it and we let them go, like, just in the nick of time. And my partners came back to me and said, oh, wow, okay, you were right. But I wasn't able to, in that moment, articulate exactly why I didn't want to hire that person. Um, and I think that's the luxury of, of being the entrepreneur who you know, kind of runs the show and just has people that work for them, but is that you can call all the shots and you can just operate on your intuition and these moments of, ugh, it just doesn't feel right. Like you just wake up in the morning, I don't know, I, just, I shouldn't hire that person. I don't know why, but it's just this bad taste in my mouth. When you have business partners, you, you can't do that. And so that for me um, was a real turning point that forced me to acknowledge um, who my audience is when I'm communicating. And in fact, um, one of my business partners, Jeremy Johnson, later said to me, this is actually kind of funny. So when I got into tech, people used to send emails all the time with smiley faces. Like, men would send me smiley faces. So I was like, okay, that's kind of inappropriate. Like, I don't think yeah. that's professional. But in tech, like, everyone's sending smiley Dudes send dudes smiley faces, like, back and forth. And so I said, I don't know, I don't know. And so Jeremy said to me once, Lauren, why don't you try sending this person, like, a, can you please get it to me by Friday? Smiley face. And see if you get your way. Like, know your audience. Lo and behold, like you got genius. I got my way. And it was just because I learned 
who my audience was, and in that moment, like who was on the other end of that email and the way in which they like to communicate with people and therefore kind of how my more formal communication was probably coming off to them. Especially in the tech world where everyone's like, da, 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 you know. I mean, it's like all emojis. It's all, I mean, I'm yeah. communicating so differently than I ever did six years ago. You're like sending five-page memos and people are like, sure, smiley face. <laughs> or like major key. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah. is that professional? I guess it is these days. I don't know. <laughs> and I know you have two kids. I do. So I'm really curious, what are your non-negotiables between business and parenthood? My non-negotiables um, are that I really, so my non-negotiables have actually changed a little bit in that my kids have become a little older. My son is eight, my daughter's six. And so they're at a point where I feel they can actually make some decisions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, great example is actually in filming the show, we made a deal. I was like, can mommy do this? Yes, and like that was a factor. Like I would not have signed on the dotted line to do this show if I didn't have the support of my kids. And so the deal was that, you know, when mommy came back, that I would spend like the rest of the summer with them, you know, the whole time. And so every moment that they were not in camp, I was a thousand percent present. I mean, like picking up from camp and like going to get ice cream from the ice cream truck and everything that I knew was incredibly important to them. And so now they get to play a part in my non-negotiables and they get to tell me the things that are most important uh, you know, where they really want me to be present in their lives and where I'm going to get the most mileage and where they're going to get the most excitement and pride. Do you have issues with uh, staying off email when you're around your kids? I ask for my own, per for a friend, not for me, just for a friend. Uh, um, you know, I think I'm always on my phone. I'm trying really hard. Um, Ido on our show has um, instituted like a digital Sabbath on Saturdays. I think that's really awesome. Although his digital Sabbath is no email. It doesn't apply to social media because he says that social media is fun. <laughs> but um, so that's actually not that's I like don't a, know. a dig I mean, Sabbath. I'm, I'm trying what I'm trying more to do because I don't think that it's realistic. I'm very type A and like I need to know what's going on at all times. So if I all of a sudden check my email and lots of things have happened A in the world or B in a business that I'm invested in or advising, I feel I feel really responsible. I feel a lot of times like, oh my God, I could have actually made a difference if I'd only known sooner. So what I'm trying to do now is, is to be better about checking email at certain times instead of constantly checking my email. So I'm checking email like three times a day. Wow, that's actually good. That's a nice little yeah, like, I just And I think it's, it's easier for me to actually maintain. It's more realistic. For you, what's the biggest challenge in shooting the show? You know, I think the biggest challenge in shooting this show is that we're all really strong personalities in different ways. And, you know, we, we are all, we all have high bars. We all expect a lot from ourselves and, and others. And so you, you will see times where, you know, it gets, it, gets, uh, it gets a little heated. And it doesn't always mean that we have to be heated against each other, but we're also all really passionate. And so when we're looking at a company, you know, we have to, to decide unanimously on our show who we're gonna invest in. And that's really hard to do, like to get us all to agree on something and not just something, but then the person as well. So we have companies where we like the product, we don't like the person, we like the person, we don't like the product. Um, and so you'll see us be really passionate about what we, what we think is the right way. Um, we all come from different industries, so our experiences are also very different. Um, and you'll see, I, I had to learn to kind of bite my tongue sometimes, and I've never had to learn to bite my tongue, like ever. <laughs> and how do you know Randy? I know Randy through um, a company that I invested in called the Levo League. Cheryl Sandberg of Facebook is invested okay. in Levo. So, you know, Cheryl kind of was, was introducing mm -hmm. the investors and the founding team of Levo to other folks at Facebook a few years ago. Um, and Randy and I have a lot in common and met, met that way. Have you met Mark Zuckerberg's baby? I have to ask. I yes. have not met Mark oh, Zuckerberg's baby. So None cute. of us on the show have met Mark Zuckerberg's baby. Well, except but, for Randy. Well, uh, except Randy, yes. But the rest of us on the show have not <laughs> met Mark's baby. I'm like, is that like a side benefit? You get to hang out at his house and play with his dog? But n probably not. <laughs> Do you go with your gut when you meet uh, entrepreneurs? Yeah, absolutely. You really I do? always say um, you have to trust your intuition. Absolutely. So what do you, when someone walks in, what's your process? Like the first meeting, what do you look at? You know, for me, I look at the way that they carry themselves, the confidence that they have, not just in themselves, but in their business, um, and the way in which they speak about where they're going. And so sometimes you'll meet the entrepreneur who's talking to you about the present moment, 
I want to hear the entrepreneur talking to me about the future. I want to hear the entrepreneur talking to me about where this company is going, not where this company is, right? Mm -hmm. Who's, you know, totally makes sense. Who, who has enough like confidence. Five-year plan, 10-year plan kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be five or 10 years. It can be next year. It can be, it can be six months from now. But the entrepreneur who comes in and says, hi, today I need, you know, kind of going back to you before saying, do I have sympathy for the entrepreneur who is coming to me with their, with their circumstance and wanting me to, like, invest in them based on that? No, I, I really want to invest in that entrepreneur who is coming in and selling me on the future, the future of them, the future of this business, its potential future dollars, you know, go to market strategy, who's already, because that really shows you how much confidence they have in where they're going. You know, do you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. That they can actually come in and say, well, and in six months, this is the plan, and this is what, we, this is what we're going to do. And as the investor, I almost want to feel like, I do, not even almost, I want to feel like you're going to do this with or without me. It's my option to come along for the ride and invest in you. Do you ever get people coming in who have done absolutely zero research? Absolutely. Really? And, who also, and who also think that they have no competition. Those are the funny ones. Like, I'll call you back for those. Oh, my God. No, I mean, I'm actually the entrepreneurs shocked. are like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to disrupt the industry or we're the Uber of blah, blah, blah industry and we've got no competition. We're going to crush it. And you're like, actually, I can name five companies right now that are doing it. Or, or at least, yes, or at least tell me, I know who the competition is. This is how we think that we can, you know, circumvent them or we can cater to another part of the market. Or, but the people who come in say, we've got no competition. There's no this. There's no that. We're just ready to be the next wonderful company on the radar. That's concerning. Where do you think that comes from? I, th I honestly think those people believe it. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's those amazing. people because those people actually have so much confidence. Like, yeah, no, there's no competition. Like, straight face. Nope. No. No. I'm gonna be the next Whole Foods, you know, because there's no Whole Foods, yeah. and you're like, no, nope, yeah. but I think they're doing quite well, actually. <laughs> I think they're okay. <laughs> and let's turn it over to our audience, please. Hey, Lauren, how's it going? Hi. I have a, um, obviously being a serial entrepreneur, you've had your fair share of moments that didn't quite pan out. If one day you woke up and you were given unlimited resources, whether they be money or people or knowledge or whatever, is there one passion project that you would immediately jump and work on? That's a really good question. And yes, the question is which passion project would it be? Um, you know, there are some things in the children's space that I wanna, that I wanna do. And I would probably pour a lot of energy into that and have my children be like the creative directors. Like the one would be like the chief creative officer and uh, my son would probably be like the chief, chief happiness officer or something. You know, this is the thing now. Like there's a new way course, to communicate. Yeah. There's also all these new C-level titles and so they'd get those. No one is a chief marketing and, officer yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, they'd get those and I think I would, I would do something in the children's space. Um, probably a few things that I think are ripe for disruption. Thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> hey, Lauren. Uh, so it's great, you know, hearing about how su successful you've been and you know all the work you've been doing. So um, juggling all these different hats, like being an entrepreneur, um, an advisor, marketer, uh, an author, and also a mother. Like, how do you like prioritize yourself? Like, keep yourself organized. So how I prioritize things is differently from how I organize things. I prioritize things based on the way. Um, based on, on how much they will alleviate in other areas of my life. So, you know, I really do try to tackle the most important things on my to-do list first. And on one week, the most important things on the to-do list may be very personal. Um, on another week, they may be, they may be very professionally um, oriented. But, you know, I think I am the entrepreneur who really truly believes that you're not successful at business until you're success until you're happy personally and so if there's something that has to get done this week that has nothing to do with work like I know I'm not going to be good at work if that's constantly at the forefront of my mind and so that's how I prioritize things and then in terms of how I stay organized um, I'm type A so like everything has a place and in fact recently everything gets labeled so that I can search it like on the computer very easily um, I have a friend a colleague of mine and friend who like tags everything so she's really good I mean it's like the most incredible thing you've ever seen in your life she is so good shout out to Megan O'Connor anyway she is um <laughs> she's really good at tagging everything she remembers where she meets people and I used to just think that she was like 
I don't know, just like have these magical powers. And she's like, no, just when I meet people, because we're always meeting so many people, you know, she tags them right away so that she knows if she met them at AOL Build or here or there. And she puts in important dates. And so I just try to tag everything. So I've taken her strategy on like contacts and kind of, um, you know, list management. And I put it into every other part of my life, like including calendar. I also remind myself of like, almost everything, so I'm constantly getting reminders. And my new thing is I build in travel time on my iCal app so that I'm like always on timer early. That helps. That's amazing. <laughs> you would not, you would actually not believe. I, well, actually, I, I don't need to be telling you this, that's preaching to the choir. The lateness factor, oh my God. Yep. Yep. And people are like, I didn't know there's gonna be traffic, really? Yeah, and look, and if you put in that travel time, actually Apple will tell you when there's gonna be oh, traffic. Oh, absolutely. It'll tell you that you should leave earlier than planned. So that's actually been very helpful in my life. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. Thank you for coming in today. So part of your job is working with companies to make their dreams come true, bouncing off on your end, following your career. What made you be in the position you're in right now, where there's a particular event down your journey that said, you know, I want to, down the road, I want to work with people and help their dreams come true? It's really been an evolution. It's a great question. Um, you know, it's been an evolution 12 years ago when I started you know, in the world of entrepreneurship, I would have never thought that I would be sitting on a stage at AOL Build talking about a TV show of mine that's coming out next week, like ever. Um, it's been an evolution of me finding the things that I'm passionate about. Um, it's also been an evolution of my life and my experiences and having people who knew me personally um, say you need to share your experiences and and one thing has honestly just led to another in a very, very serendipitous way, um, you know, including my book. When I mean, the book came out, it was, okay, we'll share these experiences. And then from that, other things came. And, um, you know, me getting into technology and startups and the venture world um, was probably the last place I thought I would ever end up after selling my first business, after selling the vineyard and winery. But it was funny because it was the exact opposite of everything that I had spent almost eight years doing. Like I had literally spent eight years watching grapes grow, like, like boring, slow, like monotonous, like just, I, I can't even, You're I can't planning even, your wedding. I, but I can't even, yeah, that too. But I can't even believe, oh, I'm divorced now, so does it count? Oh goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but I was um, reading on your bio that you were, well, I just walked right into that one. Don't do that. <laughs> That's you, dope. You got to finish. Did you read the timeline? You're reading the timeline. You got to go a little further down the timeline. There's a divorce in there. But um, anywho, you know, I think I spent all this time like watching grapes grow and in an industry where it takes so much money. I mean, you were throwing tons and tons of capital at a facility, at agriculture. I mean, you're operating you know, a vineyard, and then you've got a winery, and you've got a tasting room, and you've got employees, and it's a slow grind. Like, it's a slow grind. You don't even know if the grapes that you harvest in September, October are going to be yummy wine in, like, the spring or fall of the next year. You're, like, fingers crossed, like, Hail Mary all the time. I mean, so then to see the opportunities in the world of technology, it really just, like, I was so, like, my jaw dropped. My eyes opened. It was, it was like a kid in the candy store that all of a sudden you could you know, meet an entrepreneur and angel invest in them and that these people, this is before co-working spaces, before WeWorks or general assemblies, that entrepreneurs were you know, going to work at Starbucks and work on their laptops, make decks and actually get products to market and launching websites. Like, I was like, oh my God, like, I've spent eight years building a business and these people are like quitting their jobs and all of a sudden have a business up and running in a couple of months or less than a year. And so that was fascinating to me. Um, and the, the ability to kind of diversify in that way by being an angel investor was really compelling. So it's been an evolution of and we interest. Have, and we have time for one more question, please. Hello, Lauren. Um, since technology is the growing industry happening right now, I feel like there's a lot of people in that industry and trying to branch into that industry. So when there's one product that comes out, there's different variations of that same product. How do you feel about creativity in the technology industry? Um, the way I feel about creativity um, in the technology industry is that I think the best technology companies are those that are listening to what their users want and what their users need. Um, and, and so it's a mix of creativity with what's gonna actually make people's lives better or easier or what's gonna make them more engaged in that product. I think that tech is really interesting in that way because you can't just 
force things on people because they're creative, because they're not always gonna resonate. That may not be why the user is coming to um, that particular platform or using that app or going to that company. Um, you know, some people may wanna go to a certain place because it's, it's, a, it's a brain trust, it's a knowledge portal. Some people, you know, like, do you want creativity when you're looking for a job online? Do you want creativity when you're like on Fresh Direct? I mean, there's just some places where you really don't want creativity, you just want efficiency. And so I think the best um, technology companies are the ones that are listening to their consumer and trying to be creative in a way that they think their consumers are gonna be most receptive and responsive to. That's a great answer. And the show premieres on March 30th on Oxygen. And anyone out there with a dream, watch it. And I think we all have dreams. Watch it. Come on, season two. Thank <laughs> Send you. us your ideas. And thank you so much for being here, Lauren. Thank you, Donna.